Okay, welcome back, everybody. It's been not even a week, and we have a lot to get to. Ton of news to get to. The World Health Organization has declared the coronavirus a public health emergency now. So this thing is spreading. Oh, boy. We can look at the CDC. This thing is jumping to other countries. It's spreading pretty quickly. I'm going to go over some of the data and take a look at how quickly this virus is spreading. I also want to look at some of the emails that I got for the previous week. A lot of people wrote in asking about the coronavirus and, and had different takes on it. So I'm going to be going over some of that in this video. We also have Boeing securing more debt. We'll see how this plays into paying their dividend. We have MoviePass. In a shocking turn of events, this company is going bankrupt. Nobody could see this coming. A, a company with a business model like MoviePass, the legacy has ended. This thing is finally dead. We're going to be talking about this a little bit. We have the Fed maintaining interest rates. We have jobs reports coming out. We have my portfolio along with emails and different questions and comments and criticisms, as well as I want to talk about some fun things for the weekend, upcoming documentaries. I've actually read about this whole McDonald's scam in the past, but I want to talk about this upcoming documentary as well as some other things that I've watched similar to this financial crime shows in the past that I think are fun to watch. So a lot to go over in this episode. I think it'll be, I think it'll be a lot of fun. So let's start off with my portfolio. First of all, I have two separate portfolios. So I have my passive income one here, that's the title of it. And then I have one that is a Roth IRA, which is an individual retirement account. It's one that you can only contribute up to $6,000 a year to, and all the gains in it are tax-free. That's the other one that I have right here. Now I do something a little different here where I show everything that I'm invested, how much money I have invested and the specific companies that I'm invested in. So I have in every single video, like the one that you're watching currently, I have a bunch of different links in the description, but two of them in particular reveal all my different holdings, the allocation I have set to each of them. One of them, this view my main portfolio, it'll take you to that passive income one that I show in every video. The other one, view my Roth IRA, that of course takes you to my Roth IRA. So. I'll go over both of these real quick. This one is my passive income one. This one is structured in a certain way that I have structured it where I broke everything out into sectors and each sector is broken into what M1 Finance calls a pie. It's pretty much a way of organizing all these different companies. For instance, I can take any of these. I'll go to industrials here. I can click on my industrials pie. Overall, this makes up 4% of my portfolio, so not a ton of money in this, but I have all my industrial companies that I own in this. I could go to healthcare here. This one makes up 11% of my portfolio, and I have all the healthcare companies that I own in this. This portfolio is a stock picking portfolio. I have handpicked every single company in this portfolio. So they're based off of different metrics I look at, like companies that I think have either fantastic products or services, they have a wide moat, you know, it's hard for competition to come in and, and battle these companies. They're all ones that typically have paid dividends. They continually pay dividends and raise the amount that they're paying. They are more conservative value-based companies that have lower PE ratios than your typical growth companies. They all fit certain characteristics that I really like. So this is a stock picking portfolio. It's all based off stuff that's my personal opinion and the way that I evaluate these companies. Now I have another portfolio. This one is my Roth IRA. If I go to my Roth IRA, this one's a little bit different because there's no stock picking going on here. This is all ETFs. These are all different funds. I just put money in them and all these different funds, they continually feed me back interest and dividends over and over and over again. That gets reinvested back into this portfolio and there you see some compounding effect from it. Now, the funds that I've picked are specifically ones that are like real estate and dividend paying companies along with high interest bonds. So. All of this is aimed around the same goal of generating passive income. The only reason that I didn't name this portfolio passive income is because then I would have two portfolios named the same thing and that would be really confusing. So I have my primary one that has the majority of my money in it named passive income. I have my retirement one named Roth IRA, but the goal for both of them is passive income. They both have the exact same end goal. The vehicle that I use to accomplish that goal is a little bit different. On this one, I'm just using ETFs, which are funds. There's no stock picking. It is extremely passive because I don't have to do anything to manage these. So depending on what type of investor you are, if you enjoy picking out the companies you want to own specifically, then you can pick out the companies you want to own. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if that's something that doesn't excite you, that you don't like looking at companies and really analyzing them, I would just go this route, just buy ETFs. It's really a simple solution. It's easy to do and it's entirely passive. I mean, you don't have to do anything to manage this. So I just put money in this and I watch the money roll in and the compounding happen. It's 
super simple. Now I maxed this out for 2019. So last year I put $6,000 into this. I'm going to be doing the same for this year. I'm just waiting until I get my taxes behind me. Once that's done, I'm going to be putting another $6,000 into this account and we'll see how the Roth IRA does. But so far it's doing really good for the amount of time that I've been invested. It's been giving me very solid returns. Now, just a warning for people that are new dividend investors, people that just started their portfolios, like maybe a couple months ago, you just started getting into it. Just realize that January is the worst dividend month of the year. So if I go to my activity feed here and I filter by dividends, so this is just showing me the dividends I've been paid. This is the entire month of January. I've received only a handful of dividends. That is by far my lowest month. If I look at December, just from December 26th to the 31st, I received way more dividends. So the entire month of January, I'm not receiving a lot in dividends. In fact, if I go look at my graph that I keep track of my month over month dividend income, from December 2018, I earned $92. The next month I earned 25. It goes down substantially. We're gonna see the same thing happen here. December of 2019, I earned $343. In January, you're gonna see that go down a lot as well. Now, if we look at the performance of this week, we can see what exactly the coronavirus is doing with the market. It's causing quite a bit of market volatility. So if I look at the past week, overall, not too much, down about half a percent, 500 bucks. But if I look at just the past day, that's where most of this has happened, down $500. In fact, if I go to the graph of the S&P 500 here, these are a full percent changes. It going up a percent here through the middle of the week, then back down a percent, and then it spikes back up a percent, then back down a percent. And I think this is largely due to the coronavirus. This thing is spreading and we got pretty big news just a day ago. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. The main reason for this declaration is not because of what is happening in China, but because of what is happening in other countries. So there it is. It's an international health emergency now. The reason that he cites for this is because he knows that China has been doing a lot to deal with this. China can do all sorts of crazy stuff. They are an industrial power of the world. So they can do things like build a hospital in five days. They can quarantine entire cities. They have a lot of means to work with, even though this is wreaking a lot of havoc in China. We're going to be looking at a lot of the stuff that it's doing in China specifically. But because this thing may jump to other poorer areas of the world, there's entire areas of the world like Africa and India that are a lot poorer than China that don't have the same means to deal with it. They're declaring it a health emergency. They think that it might become something a lot bigger. So what I want to do is look at how fast this thing is spreading. The World Health Organization gives daily briefings on this virus. So it started off in January 20 of 2020. So just 11 days ago is when they came out with their first briefing. 11 days ago, the total confirmed cases were 282, and it was only in three different countries here. So we have it in Korea, Japan, and China, and it's in four different areas of China. Just a day later, we have 314 cases, so that's not a drastic jump in one day, but if you look at the number of areas that it's in, it's all over China now. Like the, the places that it's been in China has like tripled. So we have different cases in all sorts of different cities throughout China, but now it's in Japan, Korea, and Thailand. So they had two cases in Thailand. One day after that, this is the 23rd of January, we now have 581 cases. So now it's starting to speed up quickly. We have it in Japan, Korea, Thailand, and one case in the United States. This is the first one in the United States. On the 24th, we have 846 cases. So in about four days, it went from like 200 to 846. We now have it in Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Republic of Singapore, Thailand, and the United States of America. On the 25th, this is day five. We have 1,320 cases. We have Korea, Vietnam, Republic of Singapore, Australia, Thailand, Dominican Republic, United States, French Republic, a total of 1,320 confirmed cases. Day six, it goes from 1,300 to 2,014. So now we have 2,014 cases. Day seven, we have another almost 800 confirmed cases. We added in a couple countries, Nepal and Malaysia and others. Day eight, it jumps to 4,593 cases. So that went from, what was it? 2,798, so 2,700 to 4,500 in one day. That's the number of confirmed cases. You can see this graph here showing all these areas that it's spreading. So Australia, Japan, Germany, France, these are areas that are gonna be able to deal with it. They have a, a pretty good medical infrastructure, but you have a lot of poor places. You have Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, 
that don't have quite the medical infrastructure to deal with it. So those are places where they're more concerned about. Day nine, we have 6,065 cases. And then the last surveillance that we have is 7,818 cases. This was day 10. This is on the 30th, just a couple days ago. 7,818 cases. And you can see the number of countries that it's in. It's all over China now. There's just red dots everywhere all over China, as well as it's spreading to more surrounding regions. Now, how will this affect investors? It's difficult to say, but one thing that we know is that any uncertainty typically brings the market down. Now, there's two different sides of the coronavirus. There's how does this affect business and the global economy? And how big of a deal is this virus as far as health concerns? Do you think it will become a pandemic in the US? My thoughts are that I think that this really could affect the global economy. There are concerns of slowing growth because of China and the, the things that they're doing. But I do not think it will be a, a huge concern for Americans as far as the actual health concerns go. So I don't think it's going to become a pandemic in the U.S. I think we have much better facilities to deal with this. Now, I did get some emails on the subject over the past week. I said something to the effect that a big drop last Friday in the stock market was a result of somebody in the U.S. getting the coronavirus because it coincided directly with that. Now, we don't know exactly why the stock market goes up and down. You know, there's no polls that they do of why did everybody sell exactly during this time? And why did everybody buy during this time? So typically when events line up with buying and selling, they just look at big news that happened that may have triggered that. So there was a drop last week that resulted in a lot of selling. I said that it probably has to do with somebody in the U.S. getting the coronavirus. But I had some other people write in and tell me their input. They had different ideas of why the stock market dropped. One of them was an email from Lewis. He says, Joseph, I really like your show and listen to it every week. However, I think the dip in the market late last week was not due to one of the additional cases of the virus in the U.S. I think it was more due to the large presence of American companies in China. Things like Disney closing parks, fast food chains closing locations, the possibility of a supply chain interruption due to slowing or closing of manufacturers or shipping delays and the reduced purchase demand of China are affecting the U.S. markets. Keep up the good work. One of them is from Kyle. He says, hi, Joseph. Happy Chinese New Year. I'd like to share some thoughts about the coronavirus in response to your snippet in this week's episode. I completely agree with you about how the media's approach in detailing the events have been a bit overdramatic, though hear me out on this. China has been making it immensely clear that they are taking this event very seriously, so much so that the places that have otherwise been packed with people for Chinese New Year, Disneyland Shanghai, Beijing Temple Fair, Guangzhou Flower Fairs, many others, are now completely empty. Citizens have been told not to leave their homes and there have been extreme measures to vet each person as they board or arrive via air travel, causing massive delays. When a huge population of China is pretty much in shutdown for the time being, that could potentially lead to some economic factors regarding trade with other countries, no? Please let me know your thoughts on this since I think it might be of interest to you and your viewers. Thanks and keep up the great videos. Can't get enough of them, Kyle. Okay, so to both Kyle and Lewis, I appreciate the messages and I'll say that uh, I think you might be right. If I look at the news here, we have news at McDonald's, restaurants like this are closing over 300 locations, they say here, and that they're likely to close more. We have Disneyland Shanghai closing, which for sure will affect their earnings. And then probably worst of all, we have Starbucks closing over 2,000 locations amid this outbreak. That's a, a lot of business for Starbucks. So obviously, U.S. companies are going to be affected by this, and there's probably a lot more that are affected either directly or indirectly because of this. So... There's a lot of concerns with companies that do business here. Now, as far as how all this business in the U.S. being affected affects the stock market, the U.S. stock market, well, they have some information here. I'm going to put a graph on, on the screen, and it has some information on historically how these type of events have affected the stock market and the best time to put your money into the market. So with SARS, the best time was right when the World Health Organization declared it an international emergency. Right when that announcement was made like a day ago, that would have been the best time to put your money into the market. Typically over the average since 2003, from any event like this happening, it's been the week or two leading up to the World Health Organization listing it a public health emergency. So we just had them do that a, a day ago, and the weeks preceding that would have historically been the best time to invest. So I think right now, at least historically based, it's a decent time to put some money in the market, especially if you're seeing large market drops day over day. That's a good time to buy some shares because typically if it follows the same pattern of these other viruses like SARS and bird flu and wine flu, it'll go for a while and then we'll be able to deal with it, create some vaccine or something, 
and eventually it will go away and the market will return to where it was. Business will go back to normal and people want to put their money that they've taken out of the market back into it. So if you can buy right now during all this fear and uncertainty, you might be able to get a little bit better of a deal. Now, I want to look at how China is dealing with this in particular. It's been pretty fascinating. They've been building entire hospitals in like five days. So there's aerial shots of the, them having all this heavy machinery out there at the same time. I don't think in the U.S. this would ever be allowed anything even close to this. As well as I'm sure these hospitals aren't completely fitted with all the latest medical technology. I'm sure they're just places mostly for people to stay in rooms. But regardless, the fact that they're able to build these things in like five days is pretty incredible. China has been responding with an overwhelming reaction. They have literally quarantined an entire city of 13 million people. You can see images here of people showing that they are dumping huge mounds of dirt on roads to block people and prevent them from leaving. They have all different pictures of this here. They have giant mounds here on the street. You can't get out. If you're in Wuhan, you're stuck there. Now, I've seen different people's opinions on this, whether this type of quarantine is helpful. One issue with it is that when you announce you're going to have a quarantine, you have a lot of people that say, I don't want to be here for that. I want to get out before this quarantine happens. The mayor of Wuhan, the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak, says 5 million people left the city before travel restrictions were implemented. 5 million people, they, they jumped ship. They said, we're out of here. I don't want to be stuck in Wuhan for who knows how long. So 5 million people. That's a pretty massive exodus of the city of Wuhan before the actual quarantine took place. So that might have been more people leaving than would have otherwise left if they had no quarantine at all. So if they said you can freely travel to and from to other cities, who knows if 5 million people would have fleed Wuhan. Maybe people would have stayed put because they didn't feel trapped there. So there's some different opinions on how effective that really is. Now, we also have video footage of inside Wuhan hospitals, and it's just way, way overpacked. They have way more patients. The influx of new patients that they have is way more than the infrastructure they have built out to handle this. This is part of the problem of comparing countries like China and the lethality rate of different viruses there and saying that, okay, since it has a 3% mortality rate or lethality rate there, it's going to have the same thing in the U.S., usually we can treat it better. We, we can give more supportive care. We're not going to have the same level of influx of patients that we're not going to be able to treat. So you can just tell. I mean, look at this thing. They're, they don't even have chairs to sit down. A lot of people are just sitting in hallways. Now, the U.S. has remained saying that the coronavirus, the risk of extensive infections is low in the U.S. So from the CDC, they say this is potentially a very serious health threat. But at this point, Americans should not worry about their safety. We're developing vaccines. We have a lot of infrastructure to give people supportive care and treatment that do get infected with the virus. So the likelihood of them dying here is very low compared to other less developed countries that don't have that infrastructure built in. And on top of that, one good thing about coronaviruses is from what I've read, when they evolve, typically they become less deadly. They become less lethal as they evolve over time. So hopefully that's the case. Hopefully this thing just follows the pattern of other ones where it has a little bit of a boom and then it just fizzles out over time. That's what we can hope for. In other news, moving on from the coronavirus, we have Boeing. This company is still struggling. They have a lot of cash problems, so they need to get more cash. They did that by the form of $12 million in new loans. So they took out loans from a bunch of different lenders, $12 million worth, and this shores up their balance sheet. Now, we just heard last week from the CEO of Boeing, it says, Boeing CEO says it will keep paying its dividend despite the max crisis. And then a week later, we hear that Boeing secures more than $12 billion in financing to help weather the 737 MAX crisis. Now, a lot of people listening to this will go, well, they need money. They're paying out shareholders this dividend that's about $2 billion a quarter. Why don't they just cut their dividend or cancel their dividend for a while and use that $2 billion instead of taking out new loans, right? Why do they choose to take out loans instead of cutting their dividend? So I wanted to go over this and break it down real quick. Companies have a few different ways of raising capital. One of them is to raise debt. That's the option that Boeing chose here. Another one is to sell equity in the company. So companies can sell shares or they can buy shares. When they buy their own shares, that's called share buybacks. And then they have the option to cut dividends. That's another way to free up cash flow is not pay out the shareholders those dividends. And then I would say the last obvious one is to reduce expenses. So just cutting down on employees or, or different costs shores up their balance sheet as well. Now, out of those options, Boeing chose to raise debt and to reduce expenses. 
They did not choose to sell equity or cut their dividend. I believe that they chose the option of raising debt and reducing expenses specifically because it has the least amount of effect on company share price. If they were to cut their dividend, their share price would fall quite a bit. I think that that would be the obvious result of it. If they cut their dividend, a lot of people are gonna sell the shares. It makes all those other factors more difficult. Now, if they wanna sell equity, they can't sell it for as much. Now it's more difficult to raise debt. It makes all these other options a little bit more difficult if their share price falls. So they're trying to weather through this without their share price falling too much. They know if they cut the dividend, that's kind of a last result because it is going to result in a share price decline. Another company that made it back into the news this week is MoviePass. MoviePass is deader than ever as parent company officially goes bankrupt. So if you're not familiar, this was the money losing company where they pretty much gave a bunch of people credit cards and they said, you can only use this at movie theaters. We're going to put like $30 on the credit card every single month and you pay us $10 every single month. So that was the idea behind the company. It turns out, you know, when you run through the math, it, it's like, this should make sense. Giving everybody $30 and taking in 10 per month should make sense, but somehow the math didn't quite add up and the company's now bankrupt. It says, at one point after dropping its price to a dangerously low $9.95 a month in the summer of 2017, MoviePass amassed around 3 million subscribers. But many of those users, myself included, fled after the company began doing everything it could to restrict how the service could be used. Because its unlimited plan in its original form was directly contributing to an immense company-killing quarterly losses. According to a separate filing from the SEC last year, MoviePass and its various other businesses, including a firm production and distribution arm, cost Helios and Matheson, that's the parent company of MoviePass, more than half a billion dollars. So they lost a lot of money. Half a billion dollars. The company is now finally shutting down. For a while, they were saying, maybe we can get some buyers. Maybe we can get somebody to come in here and bail us out. We don't want to have to go through bankruptcy. It turns out nobody wanted to buy this company. I can't imagine why. Maybe it has to do with them just giving money to other people. That's what MoviePass did was it took investors' money and it just gave it to their customers. That may be why they couldn't find any other buyers of it, but now they're they're officially declaring bankruptcy. The whole thing is done. On this note, I will say there are some companies that use this model where they're not quite profitable, but they're growing the company and they have estimates that at some point they will become profitable. There's big distinctions to look at though. MoviePass they were just giving away more money than they were taking in. And the core of their product was giving away more money than they were taking in. That was the reason that people signed up for it, was just because they were paying a smaller amount for movie tickets than they could otherwise. Now with other companies, they actually could be profitable, but they're just using all their money, all their revenue to reinvest back in their business. That's similar to what Amazon has done. Amazon posts a loss, but really they're a profitable company. They, they could make tons of money, tons of profits, but they just reinvest everything back in their business so that they can stay at a loss and avoid paying taxes. MoviePass, that was never the situation. There was never an option for them to become profitable. To be able to become profitable, they have to make more money than they spend as a company, and there was no option of doing that. There's nothing that they could cut, no expense in the way. If they change their formula to become profitable, all their customers would flee, which is exactly what happened. There's an important distinction to be made between those two different scenarios. Okay, that's enough business news for now. Let's get to some emails. Joseph Carlson Show at gmail.com. That's Joseph Carlson Show at gmail.com if you want to email in. The first one is from Ray. He says, Hi, Joseph. I had a question for you as I trust and value your opinions on investing. I'm 33. I make roughly $100,000 a year, but with a house, a wife, and three kids, I'm still primarily broke. For the past two years, I've been following Dave Ramsey and trying to pay off debt. We drive all beaters, don't vacation, and have no open credit cards. Since binge-watching your show and doing a lot of financial planning for the future, I've come to the terms that even though I'm not 100% out of debt, I'm getting older and need to start investing for retirement sooner than later. I have roughly $5,000 in medical bills, $1,500 in credit card debt, and $17,000 in a 401k loan left to pay. My thought process starting in 2020 was to do both. I was going to continue paying down debt where I could, but also make more aggressive stand on investing. Putting 5% to a credit union savings account, 5% to a 401k, 5% to M1 and starting a portfolio. What are your thoughts? Thank you for your time, Ray. Well, Ray, I appreciate the email. I want to first highlight 
the the first paragraph there, you have a sentence. You say, I make roughly $100,000 a year, but I still feel primarily broke. That's pretty illustrative of a lot of people's situations where you're making good money. Your, your income is pretty high and you feel like you should be further ahead than where you are because you're seeing all this money come in, but then somehow it just disappears. This is my least favorite feeling. And it's something that I've been faced with previously where you start making good money and you're going, man, I, I bring in all this money. Every paycheck is pretty big, but it goes into your checking account and it just flies out of your checking account just as fast. And you wonder at the end of the month, where did all that money go? Why do we have so many expenses and debts that we're servicing? All this money I'm making is just flying away. And then you think, what if I stop making this money? What if I stop making this money? What if I lost my job? If I have this many expenses that I'm not saving anything while making $100,000 a year or $80,000 or $70,000 a year, what happens if I stop making that amount of money for any amount of time? So it's not the ideal situation to be in. What you're doing by paying down this debt is getting yourself out of that situation. You want as much buffer room as you can so that you can say, I make a lot of money and I keep a lot of money that my expenses, it's not just flying out of my checking account. It goes straight to my checking account, then it goes to my savings accounts and investments, and I continue to build up this huge sum of money on the side. So you're working towards that. You say that you have $5,000 in medical bills, 1,500 in credit card debt, and $17,000 in a 401k loan to pay off. What is that, Six, uh, uh, 20, $23,500, 23,500? That's not bad. That's not a lot of debt. $23,000 is not a lot of debt. You'll have that paid off in no time, especially if you're following Dave Ramsey and you're really adjusting your lifestyle, beans and rice, rice and beans, all the stuff he says. If you're doing that, you're going to have this $23,000 behind you in no time. I think your goal of breaking it up between the portfolio and your 401k and your, your credit union savings account, all of that is okay. I think it's good to start investing before paying off every bit of debt because a lot of people, they just delay investing. They never jump into the game. So I think building that habit of investing is important, but I would prioritize the debt over the investments. So if I was to break it up and say, I have dual goals, I wanna build up investments and I want to pay off debt, I would put the majority of the money or at least priority into my debt first. That's the area that I would do it. Specifically the credit card debt. I would get rid of that completely, the 1500 bucks before you do any investments. Then I'd focus on the medical and then the 17,000 of the 401k. So that's the way that I'd break it up is I just tackle the debt with the majority of your free money you have. And I would slowly in the background also be building up the M1 portfolio. So I think your plan is good. If you were to ask Dave Ramsey, he would give you different advice. He would say, don't worry about investing at all until you have every single penny of paying down your debt paid off. That's okay advice as well. I don't think that that serves you poorly. I just think that people need to build the habit of investing before they, they pay off debt for years. Having that habit's really important. So I really think that you should be investing during all of this, but I would prioritize the majority of your discretionary money into the debt first. Scott says, the CDC says the fatality rate for this is about the same as that of the flu, which is about 0.03%. So 41 out of 1400 is about right, but I digress. I think you might have the math a little confused there. I'm pretty sure 41 out of 1400 is 3%, right? not 0.3%. So I think that might be a little off, but regardless, you say, so do you think that it's the coronavirus scare that's driving the markets down or perhaps the impeachment proceedings that's going on? Those are the two big things in the news. I think out of the two, it's definitely the coronavirus driving the markets because the impeachment, I've talked about this before, investors make big market moves based off of information that is unknown where the outcome is completely unknown. With the impeachment, investors are expecting for President Trump to not be convicted and removed from office. If he was convicted and removed from office, convicted by the Senate, that would be huge news. That would be a driving force in the market. I think that that would catch investors off guard by a lot, but I don't think that that's going to happen. I think it's very unlikely that's going to happen. So out of those two, between the coronavirus and the impeachment proceedings going on, I definitely think the coronavirus is a thing driving the market moves. It's unknown. Investors don't know what's going to happen. It's shut down basically the whole economy of China, our biggest trading partner. So we really don't know what's going to happen with this. And until it gets settled, the markets are going to go down as a result of it. Alter7 says, great podcast. What do you think of private REITs like Fundrise? I've been asked this question a lot. Thanks, first of all, Alter, for saying great podcast. I appreciate that. But your question, 
what do you think a private REITs like Fundrise? So for people not familiar with Fundrise, it's a it's like an app, a website that you can go and and it is a, just a, a private real estate trust. So you give your money to them and they invest in these these big projects and then they pay you dividends based on the outcome of the projects. Now, looking over, I haven't done a ton of research, but what I have seen is that it's a pretty solid product. I think it's a good company. I think for what they do, they do it pretty well. And it seems like people that have invested in them and, and kept their money in them have earned decent returns. I think the biggest downside with companies like Fundrise or Lending Club or different alternative investments like that is liquidity. When you put your money in companies like Fundrise, they can pretty much hold your money for as long as they want. So they need your capital to fund these real estate projects and your capital's locked up with them until they finish those real estate projects. So don't view it as the same thing as like buying a REIT on M1 where you can sell in and out of it any time of the day that the market's open. With Fundrise, it's far less liquid. Same thing with like Lending Club. If you're doing peer-to-peer -peer lending, you have to wait until the actual note of that loan is up. So your money's tied up and you don't really realize how important liquidity is until you need your funds to be liquid. So once you realize that you can't get your money out of an investment, then you realize, oh, this is why people really value liquidity. So that's my biggest warning with companies like Fundrise, like Lending Club, peer-to-peer -peer lending, private REITs. Liquidity is a huge issue. Make sure that you look how quickly you could take your money out before you invest in companies like those. Austin says, hi, Joseph. I was wondering if in one of your next videos, you could talk about the CEO of Realty Income Corp leaving and what you think the reason was. So I did see that news, Austin. Uh, Realty Income Corp, for people that don't know, it's a real estate investment trust, just like we we're speaking about. It's a real estate investment trust, but it's publicly traded and they pay dividends monthly. So it's actually my largest holding. It's just a solid monthly dividend paying company. I really like it. I think that they own really high quality real estate all throughout the US and some in Europe and Canada. And I just really like their business model. So now the, the CEO has split from the company, which anytime you read that, you can just infer that the CEO was pretty much fired. So the board had a reason for getting rid of the CEO. There's obviously some disagreements going on, something like that. I don't think that he would choose to just leave in this type of way. That's typically not how it goes down. But the reasons why, we don't know. All we can do is speculate. We haven't really seen any news come out specifically addressing why. Ori says, hello, Joseph. My name is Ori and I love the show. Following it since episode five. I had a question that crossed my mind and I think that you are the right guy to ask. I hold some stocks that went up really nice like AT&T and Intel. I'm not holding too much of them right now, but I'm collecting dividends nicely for the past seven months. The question is if I should buy more of the stock, even though it went up pretty good, or should I keep collecting the dividends and find new stocks to buy for now? Thanks a lot, Ori. Okay, Ori. So I get this question a lot. I think that you just keep investing as normal. Companies that go up in value, you don't know how far they're going to go up in value. If it's a solid company, if its outlook is still good, if it's not theoretically the biggest it could ever be in the world, just keep investing in it. All these companies have a lot more room to grow. So I would just keep investing in them. I wouldn't worry about getting to some artificial point with the company and then putting money into something else. I kind of do that with the M1 automated investment system, but more that just keeps each company to a target percentage weighting in my portfolio. So not exactly the same thing there. I don't look at any company like Disney or Costco and go, wow, it, it went up this much, so I'm going to stop reinvesting in it. I'm going to stop buying more shares. I look at them and I say, how much more can this company go? Can Costco keep growing? Does Disney have ability to keep growing beyond what it currently is? So I think you should view it through that lens. Let the winners continue to grow. If they've gone up in value, that's a great thing, but that's no reason in and of itself to stop investing them. The reason that you stop investing in them is they've gone up in value further than what they really deserve. If they do not deserve to be the valuation they're at, that's a different thing. But a lot of times people don't know that. There's people that have sold out of Tesla. I was reading through an entire comment section of people that sold out of Tesla when it was like 200 bucks a share because they made money on it. So if they would have just held on to it, they would have made so much more money. But they bought into this thing of when a company goes up in value, that's when you have to do something, when you have to change something. I don't think so. I think you keep just investing in the company as long as it still has a positive outlook. Okay, so that's all the emails I'll do today. I wanted to, you know, it's the weekend. I wanted to go over some fun things that I've watched in the past that you might check out. Some things I'm looking forward to watching in the future. 
I have up right here, Dirty Money. This is a Netflix series that it's under this whole genre. I don't really know what to call it. There's a genre of true crime. So if you watch a true crime show, there's lots of podcasts and TV series uh, dedicated to true crime, but typically that is violent crime. So it's real life stories of violent crime and, and how it unfolded. There's a lot of series based off of that. One of them would be Dirty John. That's a Netflix series right now that's about true crime. Now there's another category that is financial crime, but it's true financial crime. So I like watching things that are true financial crime. You have American Greed, you have Netflix series like Dirty Money, which go over different subjects of, of different events that have happened that are all financially related, whether it's payday loans or the tale of Valiant, the company that Bill Ackman supported that spectacularly failed. I think it's a pretty fun genre to watch. So I've watched this whole series. I think it's pretty entertaining. Another documentary that is from HBO that's coming out February 3rd, so just in a few days. This one I'm really looking forward to seeing. It's called McMillions. It's about the Monopoly game that McDonald's made. For 10 years, this game was rigged. There was somebody that rigged it. There was a lot of co-conspirators. They gave people a million dollar awards to a lot of people that scammed the system. So this documentary goes into it. I think it looks really entertaining. I have a story for you. This story has got everything. Revenge. Drugs. Greed. Ronald McDonald. Somebody went to the FBI and said, guess what's happening? The McDonald's Monopoly game was fixed. The Bureau thought it was just some BS story. We had eight original individuals, which turned into 53. The vast majority of these winners, they're good people. One of my biggest regrets has been involved in this McDonald's thing. Yeah. You can get away with something over and over and over. You only gotta be caught once. This one looks like a lot of fun, so I'm definitely gonna be watching that, but I will leave it there. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Uh, don't let scary news scare you out of the market. It's okay seeing some red in your portfolio, so stay strong. I'll check up with you guys next week. You have a good one.